Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Rise right, so up as we pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you very much for the Bible study tonight. Thank you because you brought us together so you can impart your vision and revelation to everyone. We pray, Lord, as we come today before you, we'll stand before you as your real children, eager to hear what you have to tell us. And whatever you tell us, you grant us the grace to be obedient in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that every believer will realize the ministry that you have given each of us and will be fruitful and fulfilled in that ministry in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, that we will not be barren, Amen. will not be fruitless, Amen. but the fruit of our labor will be in the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Anoint my lips as I teach, and the ears of the people that hear, and make our heart to be stirred up to rise up and do what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at Jonah chapter 3. If you have been following us, you will know that we treated verses 2, 3, and 4 before. But now we're going to look at those three verses again. Jonah chapter 3. Reading from verse 2. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. We come to an important message tonight as we look at the content of the evangelistic message. We've been dealing with evangelism. And evangelism is a ministry by itself, an important ministry of the church, an important ministry of every believer an important ministry of the believers then and the believers now. As we think about, about evangelism and we think about this ministry, there are three things that are very important. Number one, the man. Number two, the message. Number three, the ministry. Let me start with the ministry. We want the ministry to be fruitful. And so that is going to depend on the kind of man that is involved in that evangelism. Number two, we want the ministry fulfilling. If the ministry is going to be fulfilling, fulfilling for the preacher, fulfilling for the evangelist, fulfilling for God himself, and fulfilling for Christ who died for us, and he died for all sinners, then again it goes back to the man. And it's from the man you get the message. Without the man, you don't have the message. But if the man is all right, and the message is all right, then the ministry, number one, will be fruitful. Number two will be fulfilling. Number three will be flourishing. Not just that you have results now, and then after that you don't have results anymore. You keep on having results, results, results. Let's come to the man. What kind of man? 
will be involved in a fruitful ministry, a fulfill, fulfilling ministry, a flourishing ministry. Number one, he must be saved. No blind man can lead another one, but of them will fall to the ditch. A child of hell cannot lead another person to heaven. Impossible. Somebody in darkness cannot lead another one to the light. Therefore, he must be saved. Number two, he must be separated. Separated from the world. If you're going to win people out of the world, you'll not be part of them. Just like if you are falling to the well, another person has fallen to the well. The two of them inside the well cannot deliver themselves. Neither can A in the well deliver B in the well. One must come out before he can deliver the other one inside the well. Number two then, he must be a separated man. Number three, is a sanctified man. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, purge yourselves therefore from all these and there you'll be sanctified and prepared unto every good work. Number four, you must be spirit-filled. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Number five, he must be saturated with scripture. You let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So that you'll be able to admonish other people, counsel other people, preach to other people, lead other people out of their sin and lead them to the Savior. Number six, he must be stable and steadfast. If he is up and down, today is dry, tomorrow is fresh. And then the other day he is drained. And then he doesn't know what to do again. Today is on the mountain top, tomorrow is in the valley. It's not stable, it's not steadfast. He will not be able to have a continuing ministry. And then number seven is supplicating. That means it's prayerful. Did you hear Paul when Paul the apostle said, The desire of my heart and the prayer of my heart is that Israel might be saved. When you have these seven qualities in the heart of a man, in the life of a man, he's ready, he's prepared to do the work the Lord has called him to do. And if his message is right, the man is righteous. His message is right. The combination of those two, the man and the message, righteous man, and a right message, will be able to have the kind of ministry that will produce fruit. What kind of message then should he have? Number one, the message must be clear. The message must be clear. Without the clarity of the message, there will be confusion. And if the sinners were preaching to are confused, are they going to get saved? They wouldn't even know what to pray about, what to pray for. They will not know to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. The message then, number one, must be clear. Number two, the message must be convincing. Convincing. The man is convinced, I now know I'm a sinner. I now know I cannot save myself. I now know I'm convinced that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. Not just that he died, he died for me in particular. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that if I pray, he will listen to me. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The message then, number two, must be convincing. Number three, convicting. You know, you can convince the mind, convince the brain, convince the head. But the fellow is not convicted. How many people are convinced that sin is wrong? How many people are convinced that adultery is wrong? Fornication is wrong and stealing is wrong. How many people are convinced that smoking and drinking are actually wrong? But they're not convicted. And therefore the message number three must be convicting. When the people then will be running to the Lord. Lord, I want to be saved. How can I get out of this predicament and problem in which I find myself? Number four, the message must be compassionate. Yes, you are clear. Yes, you are convincing. And yes, you are convicting, but then you are compassionate as well. You have compassion upon them. You want them to get saved. You don't want to say anything or do anything that will rub them the wrong direction, but something that will make them to want to call upon the Lord because of your love. Number five, the message must be comprehensible. Comprehensible. That's different from being comprehensive. Comprehensible means understandable. Understandable. That means then the language you use, the vocabulary that you use, the words that you use. They will not be complicated words, difficult words that many, many people cannot understand. 
if you are talking to an individual, you look at the age of that individual, the understanding of that individual, the background of that individual, and therefore your illustrations will then be relevant and adjusted to the person you are speaking to. If you are speaking to a group of people, and that group of people, you have educated people there, you have illiterate people there, you have people who are scientifically minded there, and you have people who have never gone to school at all. Then you come to present the message to them, like you are preaching on a crusade field. Then you understand, you must not be too low that you miss the people on top. Neither must you be too high, you miss the people, you miss the people at the bottom. You make the message comprehensible. That's how to save souls. That's how to lead people to the Lord, because the message is comprehensible. Then, number six, the message is Christ-centered. You center everything on Christ. Are we talking about the sinner? Quickly talk about the Savior. Are we talking about their darkness? They quickly talk about the light. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Are we talking about their hopelessness? Talk about our hope in Christ. It's when you bring everything together that we're talking about sin, we're talking about salvation. We're talking about sinners, we're talking about the Savior, we're talking about the darkness, we're talking about the light. You make the message Christ-centered, and then when you end, you're not ending on a sorrowful note. I see, well, we're sinners, what a pity, we're sinners, we're hopeless, we're sinners, we're helpless, what can we do? You end up on a positive note, you end up with Christ. Number seven, the message is converting. Isn't that the goal? Isn't that the reason thing we're preaching? Isn't that the reason we're telling the people, come unto the Lord, and he will give you rest. He'll make a change in your life. The man, and then the message, and then you have the ministry. Let's come back to Jonah. In Jonah chapter 3, we have here the word that came from the Lord unto Jonah. I'm reading from verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh. That great city, and preach unto it the word of the preaching that I bid thee. Can you see three personalities there? Can you see three entities there? Number one, God. The origin of the message, the origin of the evangel, the origin of the good news, the origin of the gospel. God, the planner for our salvation. And it was the word of the Lord that came unto Jonah. Number two, we see Jonah, the communicator of the message. We see Jonah, the carrier of the message of love. We see Jonah here, the one that was to be the evangelist. Go on to number three, Nineveh. We see the people. Here we have God and the love of God flowing from him and flowing through Jonah and then getting to the audience, the target audience. That means then there are three entities that are very important in the communication of the message of the gospel. Number one, God, the source of the evangelistic message. Number two, the lost sinners, the Ninevites, the people in darkness, and the people of the world, that Christ has come to save. And then number three, the soul winner, the evangelist, the channel through which or through whom the message is saved. And then as we look at Jonah preaching the gospel, and as we look at you preaching the gospel, because Jonah is gone. And you are the one here today. As we look at you preaching the gospel, there are three things that actually are very important. I'm sure you've read this before in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm reading there from the last verse. And now by the faith, hope, and charity, that's love, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. That means it's love. There are three things then that are very important. As you, as a soul winner, you as an evangelist, and you take the message of life, the message of salvation, and you take it to the people that talk to here. Number one, faith. Number two, love. Number three, hope. First, you have faith in God. That God is able to touch the hearts of the people you are speaking to. Even if they were dead before, he can open the ears of the dead and make them listen. Even if you are blind to the truth, it can open their eyes and make them see and reveal the truth unto them. Therefore, you have faith in God. With God, all things are possible. Nobody is irredeemable. Nobody has gone so far that he cannot be saved. The hand of the Lord is so long that it will catch anyone, anywhere, wherever he might have been. You have faith in God. Number two is love. You have love for the people, for the audience. 
and how that was so much missing in the life, in the ministry of Jonah himself. He wanted to declare the wrath of God, the condemnation and the judgment coming upon the Ninevites, but it wasn't filled with love. But we today, New Testament soul winners, New Testament evangelists, our hearts must be filled with the love of God. You love to tell the truth, but to tell it in love. Then number three is the hope that we have to have. Believing, hoping that the people, they're going to hear the word of God and the Lord will impact them. And the Lord will do something in their hearts, in their lives. He'll bring them out of their dungeon and captivity to Satan and sin. He'll bring them to the Lord. I pray the Lord will do it in you. That you will have the faith, you will have the love, you will have the hope that the people you are preaching to, they are not beyond the day of grace. And they are not irredeemable. That God is able to take them out of the place where they are and bring them into the kingdom of God. We're dividing the story tonight to three parts. Number one, the simplicity of the evangelistic message. The simplicity of the evangelistic message. Now, when we say something is simple, that doesn't mean the thing is uh, not having real content. For example, water. Water itself is very, very simple. But don't you, don't you see what water can do in our lives? Number one, then, the simplicity of the evangelistic gospel. Number two, salvation through the evangelistic message salvation through the evangelistic message. Number three, the summary of the evangelistic message. The summary of the evangelistic message. Let's come back to number one, the simplicity of the evangelistic message. Let's look at Jonah chapter three, verse two. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Why was Jonah successful? Why did the people of Nineveh turn away from their wickedness? Why was there a kind of city-wide conversion? Why was there conversion from the top to the bottom, from the highest to the lowest, from the most exalted in that place to the least recognized in that place? Why did they so give their lives to the Lord? Because Jonah was very faithful. The message the Lord had given him, he declared that message without fear, without favor. The messenger must be courageous. You fear the person who has sent you rather than fearing the people. You are delivering the message to you. The Lord told Jeremiah, don't look at their eyes or their faces, lest I confound you and make you a brazen wall and a great pillar. They'll fight against you, but they'll not be able to conquer you. Therefore, go forth without fear, without the fear of man, and declare the message that I've given to you, Jonah, arise and go unto Nineveh, that great city. What are you to preach? Jonah, you preach unto that city, the world. The preaching, the message that I bid me, the message that I gave unto you. The message was present should be simple enough to make the audience understand what salvation is all about. Now, if you listen to the message of Jonah, look at verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What word is here in his message? That the people of Nineveh would not understand. The word yet, 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Very simple, very clear, but complete as well. That's all they needed to know that God was giving them a period of grace. And when this period of grace is over, if they did not do anything about their lives, about their relationship with God, it will be over. Nineveh will be overthrown. Nineveh will be destroyed. And so, if we're going to really be successful and fruitful and flourishing and fulfilling in the evangelistic message, evangelistic ministry, we must be simple, we must be direct, we must be understandable, and we must be people that are able to declare the word of God without fear, without favor. Now, in the New Testament, what message are we being given that we're going to deliver to the people? What's the evangelistic message? The content of the evangelistic message we're giving to the people. Let's look at the word of God in Mark chapter 
16, Mark chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 15. Remember the simplicity of the gospel in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Here we read the word of God, and it says, and it said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the message we are to preach. Go ye into all the world. Any part of the world you go, a village, a city, a nation, in Africa, outside Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in America, in the Commonwealth of Independent Nations, Independent States, CIS, anywhere you go, in the English-speaking country or Francophone country, anywhere you go, this is what you have to preach. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And preach the gospel. And what's the gospel? The good news. What's the good news? The glad tidings that sinners don't need to perish. But Jesus Christ came, he sacrificed on the cross of Calvary so that everyone can be saved. Then he says in verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Luke chapter 24. Take the message with you. The message that was told to preach. In the case of Jonah, the Lord had given words to preach. In the case of the New Testament believer, the Lord is saying, our master, the captain of our salvation, he gave us that message. What we are to declare, and here it is, in Luke chapter 24, verse 46 and verse 47, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Now, do you understand? It's not remission of sin and repentance later. It's repentance and, after that, remission, removal, forgiveness, cleansing, pardon for sin will come after that repentance. What are we then to preach? We go out to the people of the world, whether they're men or women, whether you're preaching to a crowd or you're preaching to an individual, you're preaching that make sure repent. Repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. What are we to preach in America? Repentance and remission of sins. What are we to preach in Europe? Repentance and remission of sins. What are we to preach to the sick people? Repentance and remission of sins. What are we to preach to the poor? The poor that need money. They need the wherewithal. Where will they be able to sustain their lives? If we're preaching the gospel to them, even in their poverty, repentance and remission of sins. That's what we are to preach. And we preach that amongst all nations. Are they white? Repentance and remission of sins. Are they black? Repentance and remission of sins. And we are to preach that in all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. And let's see how the apostles carried this out. Or they preach that repentance and remission of sins. We are looking at uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore. It just went straight. And you remember Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent. In Acts chapter 2, repent. Acts chapter 3, repent. They were not tired of repentance, preaching to sinners. This is a different group. It's a different crowd. These people too need to be saved. And anyone that needs to be saved must hear the word of repentance. You don't change it. You don't say, people will say, I'm, repeat, I'm repeating myself. Because you see, last week, I was preaching to those people in Jerusalem. And I said, repent. And now I come to a new crowd, maybe still in Jerusalem. If I say repentance again, they say, doesn't he have another thing to speak about when you're talking to sinners? Anywhere they are, in any community, and in whatever situation you may find them, the message is repent. Chapter 3, verse 19. In that chapter 3, verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted. You see that that's very clear. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 26, unto your first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That's the message. That's the message. The Lord told them, he gave them the message. And he said, this is what to carry to the people of the world. And they were faithful. And they carried just that Acts chapter 13. Acts 13 verse 16. And then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, 
men of Israel, and ye that fear God, give audience to attention. In verse 26, men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is this word of salvation says, the word of salvation. You see, the people were very clear. When the people were sinners, they were not making them happy, jovial, relaxed, and talking about healing, and talking about deliverance, and prosperity, and everything. Even if they were going to get healed later, yet the word of repentance was very, very clear. And then he tells us in verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem, and their rulers, because they knew not him, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them, they fulfilled them in condemning him, though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired the pilot, desired the pilot that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. And it was seen of many, it was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people, and will declare unto you the glad tidings. The gospel, the good news, Jesus Christ has died, you don't need to die again. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is, it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now, no more to return to corruption. It says on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, it says also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer than holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served this generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption be known unto you. Therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sin. You see that? Everything still culminated in the fact that you are sinners. You need forgiveness. You must turn away from your sins so that through Jesus Christ you will have the forgiveness of sins. He has not finished your sin, but such tonight, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, beware therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I walk a walk in your days, a walk which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. A message of warning, a message of judgment, a message that necessitated consideration and repentance. That's how they preach, and that's how we also preach the word of God as well. Look at chapter 17 of Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. And I'm reading to you from verse 22. The point we are making is that when you go out as an evangelist, you look at the message of redemption, the message of salvation, and then you declare that just that to the people so that they will be saved. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of mass fear and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious, for as I passed by and beheld your devotion. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and praise and all things. And he has made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far away from 
every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being as such in also of your own poets have said for we are also his offspring for as much then as we are the offspring of God we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and means and man's device you see he's talking to idol worship He's talking to traditional people. He's talking to Gentiles. He's talking to people that have never seen the Bible. He's talking to people that have never read the Old Testament. In the other part, in Acts chapter 13, he was talking to people that were the descendants of Abraham. The people that had read at least the Old Testament. But these people knew nothing about the Old Testament. And therefore, he referred to history and creation and the life in which we live. But yet, he must come back to the real nucleus and center of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Savior. And then the sinner having the necessity of repenting and believing on the Lord so that he can be saved. Look at verse 30 now. In verse 30, and the times of this ignorance, God winged at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You see that no matter where you're preaching, are you preaching on the campus at the university? Repentance and remission of sins. Are you preaching to those highly placed people? Repentance and remission of sins. Are you preaching to the market women? Repentance and remission of sins. Are you preaching to the villagers that do not know much of the Bible? Repentance and remission of sins. Should be preaching all nations in his name. Begin at Jerusalem. In that passage, look at that passage again. And the times of this ignorance, God went at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. You see that? He still brought in the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me think, let me think about it this way. If we're going to summarize this part, the simplicity of the evangelistic message, what are the things that are very important, very essential, indispensable, that you put within the evangelistic message? Number, number one, the sins of sinners. They must be convinced. There is something to be saved from, and it is sin. Number one, then, the sins of sinners. Number two, the shame, the sorrow, the suffering for sinners. That is, if people continue to sin, they are showing them the necessity of being born again, the necessity of turning away from sin, the shame that comes as a result of sinning, and the sorrow that comes as a result of sinning, and the suffering, eternal suffering, earthly suffering here, eternal suffering in the great beyond, as a result of sinning. Number three, the sacrifice of the Savior. You don't just stop talking about sinners and about their sin. You talk about the sacrifice, the atonement, the propitiation, the substitution that Jesus Christ did and made for everyone the sacrifice of the Savior. Number four, the salvation for sinners. The salvation for sinners. As a result of that sacrifice, as a result of that atonement, as a result that Jesus Christ died for every one of us on the cross of Calvary, now we can be saved. In fact, that's why he came. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Number five, the subtlety of Satan. While you are preaching to the people, please understand, Satan will not be too far away, deceiving them. Oh, if you, are, if you make yourself better, oh, if you don't have to get saved today, there may be another chance. Are you going to miss all the good life and all the high life that you've been enjoying? Just, why don't you still wait? The subtlety of Satan. And since you know that, that's the reason why you will keep on telling them, this is the day, the day of salvation, the acceptable time unto the Lord. Number six, the sufficiency of the Savior's sacrifice. The sufficiency of the Savior's sacrifice. They don't have to do any other thing. And you don't have to say, I'm adding something to the atonement of Christ. Because that atonement of Christ, that sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. The sufficiency of Christ, of the Savior's sacrifice. Number seven, the steadfastness and the sure change after salvation. 
Don't, don't forget to tell them that. You come to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you come to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never be the same again. That is going to do an operation within you, the operation of grace. And that operation of grace will turn you around, transform your life, change you completely. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things, literally all things, have become new. Steadfastness and short change after salvation. I come to point number two. Salvation through the evangelistic message. Salvation through the evangelistic message. Let's come back to Jonah. You see, Jonah went and declared the message of God unto the people. Look at Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. Jonah chapter 3 verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. How fortunate we are today. We have a lot of people on our team when we go to evangelize. I take your district church for example. And we have a coordinator there. We have a local pastor there. We have the members of the choir there, we have the usher, security, everybody there. We have the believers there, we have the workers there, we have the members of the church there. And they can all troop out, united together, wanting to evangelize. Jonah did not have that opportunity. If he could do it without any team, how much more the people that have these teeming crowds today, that we can join together and get the work done. You come to the farm of somebody, and then as you come to this farm, you see everywhere planted, and all the ridges and all the rows are all in order. And the corn or the maize or the wheat is growing up. And everything is waving like this in the wind. And then you are asking yourself, you are saying, how did you do this? And then he lifted up a little cutlass. And he says, you see, my hand and my cutlass, this is what we have done. Then you think about it yourself. You have, maybe you have a bulldozer. Maybe you have some mechanical instruments with which you can plow and which, with which you can sow. Then you are thinking, if he, well, this little simple cutlass could do that, how about me with all these gadgets that I have? If Jonah could do it in the whole of Nineveh, and he went through three days journey announcing to the people there was no microphone, there was no car, there was no bicycle, there was nothing at all, just himself, because the Lord had sent him. Nineveh shall be overthrown yet 40 days. And then the whole of Nineveh, they repented and gave themselves to the Lord, and he turned away from their wickedness. How much more you today, with all the advantages you have, and if we don't make use of the advantages we have, he will stand up in the day of judgment and condemn us. Look at the result in verse 10 of Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3 verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And indeed he did not. A whole city God saved. If we became serious with evangelism, if we became serious for the gospel message, if we became serious with taking the message to the people that are lost and they are dying in sin, cities will be converted, communities will be converted, and states and nations will be converted. But we're sitting on the message, and we're too quiet, and yet the people are dying, and the people are perishing. If, if something will stir us up, and the Spirit of God will wake us up, the fire of the Holy Ghost will burn within us and send us out and propel us out to the people who are perishing. And like Jonah, we move from place to place, from people to people, from person to person, and from nation to nation. Many people will be saved. I pray it will happen. Yeah. It will happen through us together in Jesus' name. Yeah. Now let us see the salvation. Let's tell the people give their lives to the Lord. We're coming back now to Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, and again I'm reading to you here from uh, verse 32. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 32. This Jesus, as God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, has shed for this which he now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath 
made that same Jesus whom he crucified both Lord and Christ. Now, when they had this, they were preached in their hearts. Now, when they had this, they were preached in their hearts. Can I remind you that when you're an evangelist and you're preaching, when you're a soul winner and you're preaching, that your message must be clear, that the message must be convincing, that the message must be convicting, that the message must be compassionate. Peter said, I know you did this through ignorance. That's compassion. You are wrong, but I know that you did it ignorantly. You didn't know what you were doing. And it was Christ-centered. It is this Christ that died and was buried and he raised again. And because of the Christ-centeredness of the message, the people themselves eventually, they were converted. A convincing message, a convicting message, a converting message. Look at verse 37. It says in that verse 37 over here, it says, Now when they had this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said, Repent, repent. He preached the word of repentance to them. And isn't it interesting as you come to this place, it says, Repent. As you go to Acts chapter 17, it says, Repent. And as Jesus Christ was talking to the people in Revelation chapter 2, he said, Remember where you are falling. You have left your first love. Repent ye therefore. The word of repentance goes all through to the book of Revelation. And it is not something you can toy with or change or adapt or, you know, to do another thing. The message of the word of God to sinners is still repent. And then he tells them in verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto a generation. Then they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Salvation. Joyfully. Happily. Cheerfully. Gladly. They received the word of God. And their lives were turned around. We're looking at chapter 16 of Acts. Acts chapter 16. Reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 16. Verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Very pointed, very clear. He knew that the, the need of the hour, the need of the moment, seeing the miracle of sin, seeing God opening all the windows and all the doors of the prison, and seeing you still staying there, just glorifying the Lord and singing to the Lord, I need what you have got. Let them see that salvation in you. The way you endure your trial, and the way you sing when the going is tough. And the way you are cheerful, when it appears you ought to hang your head and be crying, and you're still joyful and happy in the Lord because Christ lives in you, and you find Christ to be all in all. Jesus is everything that I need. When they see that, and they see that he will go through it all, you're still happy, you're still joyful. Even when a miracle of deliverance has come and the prison doors are open, you're still there. And you are not in a hurry to get away from trouble. Then the people will say, you have something I'd like to have. I am the Philippian jailer here. I'm the people that keep them in captivity here. I don't have the joy you have. And you're a prisoner. What makes you have this kind of joy? I need this kind of salvation, sirs. What must I do to be saved? And they were told in verse 31, verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thine house. And they speak unto him the word of the Lord. Don't ever miss that. You know, some people just say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Yes, that's the conclusion. But here it says, And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord? All have seen. I come short of the glory of God. You need to repent of your sin. But if you call upon the Lord, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe then, and then you will be saved. They spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes. What's that? He washed their stripes. What do you think that is? Look up here. Paul and Silas had been beaten. They were bleeding in their backs. And the stripes they laid on them created wounds in their body. And he told this Philippian jailer, keep these criminals well. And because he looked at them as criminals, he kept them. He was firm. He was fierce towards them. 
And now, he saw the miracle. And then he said, I want to be saved. I want to have what you have. And he preached the word of God to him. And he believed. When he believed, do you see the change in his life? He took them. He was tender towards them. He washed their stripes. He washed their wounds. That's a form of restitution. I hurt you before. I'm sorry. I didn't know that's the kind of person you are. They told me you were criminals. They told me you were common prisoners. That's why I treated you the way I treated you. I didn't know you are messengers of the Lord. Now to show that I'm really born again, to show I'm really converted, he took them that same hour of the night. He didn't wait until another thing. He didn't say, after all, I wasn't the person that arrested you. After all, I wasn't the person that beat you. I'm just doing my duty. This is what they pay me for when you are born again. You don't do that kind of arithmetic, mathematics, logic with the Lord anymore. You contributed to the suffering of Paul and Silas. Therefore, as a form of restitution that shows that you are truly converted, you do something about it. Look at the verse again. We're told in verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night and he washed their stripes. And he was baptized, he and all his house. It's not ended. Look at verse 34. And when he had brought them to his house. You know what we're talking about? This is the, uh, the one that is the prison warden. This is the controller of the prison. Taking the common criminals. Removing the stocks. He said, you have got the make already and not put them back. And they pack them away. And then you wash their wounds. The situation. And then he said, come, you shouldn't be here. He took them to his own house and he gave them food. Do you see the conversion? When there is salvation, there's going to be a change of life. And the change of life will be very, very clear. You will not live like you were living before. You will not act like you were acting before. If you say you are saved, and then you are still keeping Paul and Silas in the prison, and say, I have my receipt for doing it. You are not born again. If you are born again, there is a change of life in verse 34. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced believing in God with all his house. That's real salvation. Let's come to Acts chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, and risen again from the dead, that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consulted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, the great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. That's real salvation. Chief women, not a few. Highly placed women, not a few. The Greeks, the wise people, the educated elites of the land, not a few. They believed on the Lord. You see, that is in Thessalonica. Uh, because go back to verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Apollo, uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Thessalonica. That's where those people believe. What change can we see in their lives? What transformation can we see in their lives? And what definitely turning around can we see in their lives? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5. He's talking about the salvation. Salvation through the evangelistic message. A turning around. A transformation. A change of life. A change of attitude. A change of action. Through that evangelistic gospel message. We're looking at Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in words only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. And in what assurance as he know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us. And you became followers of us. 
and you became followers of us, not followers of them. You see, when you are born again, you look at the people that have preached the word of God to you. You look at their lifestyle, you look at their appearance, you look at their comportment, you look at their conduct, you look at their character. And you, if we are preaching you and you have believed the gospel, you believe of the Lord Jesus Christ through us, you become followers of us, not followers of them. You keep on looking at the people that brought you to the Lord. If I are preaching the gospel to you, and you see my lifestyle, and you see my comportment, and you see my character, and you see my consecration, and you see my dedication to the things of the Lord, then you become followers of me, not of them, outsiders. Not of them, other members of the church. And those of you are newcomers and you are hearing my word at this time, you are from the Bible study at, that, at this time now, and God has used me as an instrument as an evangelist in preaching the word of God to you. And then you have come to us in the church here, I welcome you and praise the Lord for you. But understand, when you come to the church, a large church like ours, there are good people and there are some tears among the weak. So, you will not be followers of them. You'll be followers of us. Do you understand? Yes. Say yes. yes. Praise the Lord. Look at what says in chapter 1. I'm reading you verse 6 again. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith toward God, to God what is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. We need not to speak anything. For they themselves, show of us, what man of entering in we add unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. That's real salvation. That's real salvation. They turned from their idols and they turned to the true and the living God. When they say turn it, they say change. There's something you were doing before, you're not doing that anymore. There's a place to work before, you're not in that place anymore. There's a nightclub you used to go, you don't go there anymore. And there's some traditional things to worship before, you're not worshiping those things anymore. There's a, a way you get bribed and you stole before, but you're not doing that anymore. You turn from what you were and you turn unto the Lord. And there's a change, a transformation in your life. That's what we're talking about. That's the salvation. That's the salvation. It is not just that I. I raise up my hand. Yes, I always tell the people, you want to receive Jesus Christ now as your personal Savior and Lord, raise up your hand. That's good. You're indicating you want the salvation of the Lord. Then stand up. That's great. To stand up and stand up for Jesus. If I have chance, I say, come forward here. Yeah, that's good. But that's not the end of the story. The change, the grace, the transformation, the turning around in your life, that's the real salvation. In verse 10, it says, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. And then it goes on as we talk about this salvation and see what actually happens this what Jesus Christ has come to do. We're looking at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 21. This is the ministry of Jesus. This is what the angel said about the effect of that salvation when it comes. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. For he shall save his people from their sins. What are those sins? Adultery, no more. Fornication, no more. Homosexuality, no more. Covetousness and stealing, no more. Idol worship, no more. Because he came to save, and he shall save his people from their sins. Look at John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, when the change comes upon you, when the salvation becomes your own, this is what happens. In John chapter 5, verse 14, afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. That's salvation. When you've got that salvation, it's so real. 
that the things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. The things I used to drink, I drink them no more. The cigarettes I used to smoke, I smoke them no more. The hatred I used to have, I have that no more. Something happened to me because Jesus said by his grace, sin no more. John chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 8, we're looking at verse 11. She said, No man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. That's salvation. That's salvation. When the grace of God comes to you, and you know that sin is deadly, and sin is destructive, and a little sin will ruin your life, then you understand Jesus is saying, I'm not condemning you for the past, that one I forgive. I set you free from them. I break the chains and the shackles of sin in your life. Now, sin no more. Go on, sin no more. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The evidence and the results of this salvation we're talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 33 and verse 34. Be not deceived. Evil communications cause good manners. Then in verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and sin not. That's the evidence of that salvation. First John. In first John chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 18. First John chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. You see, when you become truly born again, you have the salvation of the Lord. The Lord plants His grace in your heart. The thing that wants to sin, that wanting to, that desire is taken away from your heart. You don't want to do that anymore. Whosoever, whether you are young or you are old, whether you are illiterate or you are educated, whosoever, is born of God, sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. What do we learn then? Of this salvation we're talking about. Number one, you have faith in the Redeemer. Faith in the Redeemer. When you are born again, Christ has been shown to you as your Redeemer. And you believe on the Lord Jesus that by grace you say through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith in the Redeemer. Number two, forgiveness with reconciliation. Forgiveness with reconciliation. That's salvation. That's salvation. Your sins are forgiven. The guilt is taken away. The condemnation is taken away. You are no more at enmity and uh, opposing God. You are now united with the Lord. You are reconciled. Forgiveness with reconciliation. Number three, freedom from re retribution. Freedom from retribution. Retribution means punishment that is rightly and fully deserved. The sinner deserves punishment. Retribution is punishment that is rightly and fully deserved. But now, you are born again. Now you are saved. That salvation means there is freedom from retribution. Number four, fellowship and new relationship. Fellowship and new relationship. Real salvation brings us into fellowship. Fellowship with God. And fellowship for the people of God. And you build new relationship. The old friends, they get out of your life. They don't even want to have you around anymore because your life is condemning them. And your life is like putting them down. Because you don't do the things you, you used to do with them. The silly jokes and the blasphemy was the word of God. You remember before you were born again, you used to go to church. And if the preacher preached anything, when you go out of the door, you'll take some of the words that the preacher used, and then you'll be laughing and joking and jesting with him because you are not born again. And that blasphemy that you used to commit, because you are not born again, now you are born again, you cannot joke like that anymore. You take the word of God, this heavenly treasure, you take it very seriously. And if they're joking about, they'll still joke, those who are not born again. 
they'll still guess what the word of God. They'll still take what we're preaching here and they'll still cast it in their mouth as if it's for child's play. As if it's for football and game. They do not understand the things of heaven because the carnal man, the sinful man, cannot appreciate spiritual things. But now you are born again, therefore you don't do that anymore with them. They'll cast you off. They say you become so serious and you become fanatical. They don't want to be in your company anymore. Therefore you build new relationships. Because now you have fellowship with the people of God and new relationship with people of life minded faith and then number five the fruit of repentance the fruit of repentance when somebody is born again when you are really saved and that salvation is there will see the fruit of repentance in your life and then number six the fourth fruit of righteousness the first fruit because more righteousness will still come when you are sanctified. More righteousness will still come when you are studying the word of God. More righteousness will still come when you are going deeper and higher in the Lord. But when you are born again, there's the first fruit of righteousness. Then number seven, the foundation of full redemption. The foundation of full redemption. When you are born again like that and you are saved, what you have of the redemption of the Lord is the foundation that will open the way for much, much blessing of the Lord in your life. I come to point number three, the summary of the evangelistic message. The summary of the evangelistic message. We'll come back to Jonah. In Jonah chapter three, verse four. Jonah chapter three, verse four. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, and he shouted and said, and he lifted up his voice and said, remember, he didn't have a microphone. Remember, he didn't have any loudspeaker. Remember, there was no horn speaker. And therefore, the best he could do was to lift up his voice and cry and shout and tell the people what they had done. Would you come to Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah 58 verse 1. Cry aloud. Spear not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Did he have microphone in those days? No loudspeakers in those days. And because there was no microphone and lo no loudspeaker, all they could also shout it out. And to raise up their voices like that of a trumpet. Cry aloud. Spear not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Come back to Jonah, chapter 3, verse 4. Jonah began to enter into the city this journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now as he preached the message that the Lord gave him, that was the message he was to preach to the people. What's the summary of the message we are delivering to the people? The gospel, the evangel, the good news. Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Look at carefully the summary of the evangelistic message. This is what we are to present unto the people. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all are sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Be justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal, forgiveness of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. If you will analyze those words, I just read to you now. It talks about the sinner. All of sinner comes from the glory of God. It talks about the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It talks about the Savior himself that is Jesus Christ. And then it talks about the result we have when we come to the Lord. The righteousness that we have through him. Look at chapter 5 of Romans. Romans chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 6. The summary of the evangelistic message. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when or are yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Again, you'll see that you always have to mention the sinner and the sin of the people. And then the Savior and the sacrifice and what he has done for us so that we can be saved. He tells us, for when we were yet without strength, 
in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man where one died yet paradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but God commended his love toward us in that while we are yet seen as Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies or are reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only so but we also joy we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have received the atonement far back in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 53 we have this redemption painted very clearly this word of salvation described about the sinner about the Savior, about the sacrifice, about what you will do. In Isaiah chapter 53, I'm reading there from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. You see the message of salvation there? The message of our redemption there, the message, the, the gospel, the evangelistic message right there in verse 5, surely it says he was wounded for transgression. He was bruised for iniquity, so the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Where the stripes were healed, all we like sheep have gone astray. That's the message. All our sins and come short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is our substitute. He is our sin bearer. He is our savior. The Lord, Heavenly Father, has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb for the slaughter. And as sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was his tricking. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yes, it pleased the Lord to boost him. That's talking about our Savior who sacrificed and gave himself for us. He has put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in the sun. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify, save many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil of the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors, because he identified with us, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Look at the interpretation of all that in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 24. In First Peter chapter, 20, chapter 2, verse 24, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness Ephesians chapter 2 in Ephesians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 1 the summary of the evangelistic message Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and you are still quaking, and you are still made alive, who oh, are dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God. That makes the change, the difference. But God, who is rich in mercy, for the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ. 
by grace are you saved or are dead in sin or lost in sin and the judgment of God was hanging upon us because of our sins but because of the love of God because of the mercy of God because of the grace of God he pulls us out of that sin and now we can have the mercy and the salvation of the Lord in Bathsheba and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus for by grace are you saved through faith and not that not of yourself it is the gift of God not of works, let any man show both, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. After you are saved, you don't continue in sins anymore. You are created unto good works, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twenty-one. For he made him to be sin for us. He made him to be sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's an exchange. We've given him our sin. He took our sin. He offered himself for us by our punishment. And then he gave us back his own righteousness. For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. As I look at this summary of the evangelistic message, let's, let's look at this. It's right on your notes. I'm reading from your notes now. I'm making some alterations and some adjustments though. So look at it very carefully. Now when we talk about the gospel, the evangelistic message, it is not acceptance of Christianity as a religion, but the atonement of Christ for sinners. It is not baptism as a means of salvation. It is being born again through repentance and faith in Christ. And it is not conformity to the Christian conduct, but conversion to Christ by the power of Christ. It's not denominations in Christendom, but it is the death of Christ for salvation. It is not enrollment in a church. Don't let anybody deceive you. Enroll in our church. Then that is the same. No, not at all. It is not enrollment in a church. It is eternal life through Christ. And it is not faithfulness in church attendance. It is faith in Christ. Not faithfulness in church attendance. It's good to come to church. And it's good to be faithful in attending church. But you remember that Judas Iscariot attended all the seminars, all the conferences, all the meetings, all the church services, synagogue service, that Jesus said, Judas was there all the time. There's not in heaven now, it's in hell. Therefore, salvation goes beyond just coming to church. It's not faithfulness in church attendance, it's faith in Christ. It's not good works, but the gospel of grace. Not good works is the gospel of grace. It's not cutting happiness in life. It's hope in Christ. Come and be happy. Yes, it's good to be happy. It goes beyond happiness. Don't drunkards think they're happy? They think they're happy. Don't prostitutes think they're happy? They think they're happy. Don't thieves that are able to steal a lot of money? Don't they think they're happy? They think they're happy. Salvation goes beyond happiness. It is hope in Christ. It's not ideologies of men, but it is the incarnation of Christ. And it is not joining a church. It's justification by faith in Christ. It's not knowledge of scriptures, but it's the knowledge of the Savior. Knowledge of scripture is wonderful to know the Bible. It's wonderful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. But please remember, Satan said, it is written. And he said again, it is written. And said again, it is written. Pharisees and Sadducees know some parts of the Bible. Satan even knows some parts of the Bible, but they're not saved. It goes beyond just having knowledge of Scripture, but knowledge of the Savior. It's not liberty in carnality. I'm saved, I can do as I please. That's not salvation. It is the Lordship of Christ. And salvation is not membership in a church. Salvation is mediation of Christ for the sinner before the Almighty God. And salvation is not the need of turning over a new leaf. 
is the need, the necessity of accepting Christ as Savior and Lord. Salvation is not the opinions of men concerning Christ. Salvation is the offering of Christ once and for all. Salvation is not prosperity. Yes, God prospers us. But if you so well, even without being born again, the law of sin and reaping can make you prosperous. Therefore, prosperity is not necessarily salvation, but pardon through Christ and peace with God. And salvation is not just quitting, smoking, and drinking. I'm not smoking anymore. That's great. That means you don't want to die of cancer. I'm not drinking anymore. That's great. That means you don't want to die of intoxication, stimulating your body. Quitting cigarettes and quitting drinking, that's great, but that's not salvation. Salvation is a quickening by the Spirit, and you are still quickening who are dead in trespasses and sins. And salvation is not resolution, but righteousness and redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not success in life. It's good to be successful. And if you follow the principles of success, you'll succeed. But that's not salvation. Salvation is having real sin or your sins forgiven, the salvation and the eternal life of the Lord. Salvation is not trying your best. Salvation is trusting as a believer. You are trusting the Lord. Salvation is not uniformity of the church, even with a good church. Salvation is union and unity with Christ. Salvation is not visions and revelations, but victory. The victory of Christ and his vicarious suffering for you. Salvation is not words of men. Salvation is built and based on the word of God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28 as we go to pray. Matthew chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to love all things whatsoever. I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, even unto the end of the world. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Before I end, let me just remind you that 120 people were gathered in the upper room. These were the 120 people that responded to what Jesus Christ had told them. And then they were praying. And the Holy Ghost came upon them on the day of Pentecost. Out of that one twenty, the gospel went to the whole world at their own time. Even those who are here tonight were more than one twenty. And those of you they are listening to me in your various Bible study locations in every district, you are more than one twenty in all probability. In all the states, all the nations of this continent of Africa, we are more than one twenty. If we will take the evangelism as serious as the early church took this evangelism, what lesson are we now? Are we not to lesson number eight or number nine? Even as we go through this series, we started a series on Jonah. How many souls have you won for the Lord? If we continue like this and we just hear and we never give it out, and we get the evangel, we never become evangelists. So well, the world, the one to the Lord. Now it has come to you again today, and the word of the Lord is coming to you, and the chance is now there, the opportunity is now there, that you will take this gospel and go into all the world and preach it to every creature, and the people that believe and they are baptized, they will be saved. I pray that through you, people will get saved. People will turn to the Lord, and your life, your light shining, will beam so much upon them, and then they'll say, hey, look at the one that led me to the Lord, and look at his life. I want to be like them, and then you will lead them to heaven in Jesus' name. And you're going to rise up and commit your life to the Lord, and say, Lord, I have heard. It is not only the hearers of the word that are blessed, but the doers of the word. Do you love the Lord? Do you honor the Lord? Do you respect the Lord? Are you going to say, Lord, here am I. I'm not going to waste my life anymore. I'm going to yield myself to you. I'm not going to be sluggish. I'm not going to drag my feet like Jonah. I'm going to respond to the, respond to the call of God. I will. I will do what you have called me to do. And then the blessing of God will be upon you. I open your mouth and pray and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I want to do your will. Here I am. Remember, if you are going to be a soul winner, you must be saved. You must be saved. A sinner cannot lead a sinner to the Lord. You must be saved. You must be separated from the world. 
If you see the well in the dungeon of sin, you cannot help another person to come to the Lord. You must be a separated man, a separated woman. Number three, you must be sanctified. The Adamic nature of protest. The inbred sin taken away. A total change, a total transformation in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your attitude. Sanctified. And then you must be spirit filled. You shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria to the most part of there. The call is coming upon you today. What are you going to do? Are you going to allow the sinners to be passing by, slipping off on you and not getting saved? Be filled with the Spirit of God. Have the power of God. The fire of the Holy Ghost within you. And be stirred up and get something done. The people are perishing. The people are perishing. When are you going to rise up and lead them to the Lord? And you must be saturated with Scripture. The Word of God. Read the Bible. The Bible, the Word of God that shows your duty. That shows your responsibility. That gives you the call. The call of the believer. The call into ministry. Here is what to do. And then you commit yourself to the Lord. You say, Lord, I've heard your word. I'm going to do exactly as you have told me to do. You are steadfast and stable. You are not falling and rising. You are not getting interested and disinterested. You are not cold and hot. But you are steadfastly hot. And then you are fire for the Lord every time. And you are making supplication. You are making supplication. You are praying to the Lord. You are saying to the Lord, Here am I. Use me in so winning. Use me in so winning. Use me in leading sinners to Christ. Help me abandon all other lesser things, unimportant things. Help me, Lord, to abandon useless, worthless things. Don't spend your time on things that are not of spiritual value, eternal value. Don't be a baby after so many years of learning the Bible. Be mature, be serious, let the concern of Christ be your concern. The thirst of Christ, let it be your thirst. The agony of Christ, let it be your agony. You want sinners to be saved, and you're not playing religion. As we go out, make the message clear. Make the message convincing. Make the message convicting. Make the message compassionate. Have compassion on them. Don't let your neighbors die. Don't let your mother, your father die in sin without salvation. Don't let your children die without salvation. Don't let your husband die. Don't let your wife die without salvation. Have compassion on your husband. Have compassion on your wife. Have compassion on your neighbor. Make the message comprehensible. Those are so high, we can't understand you. And a believer cannot understand you. How will sinners understand you? Make the message comprehensible. Make it Christ centered. Make the message Christ centered. Let the fire of God be your soul. Make the message full. When you talk to sinners, don't be afraid of them. Faith will cancel fear. Love will cancel fear. Remind those sinners of the shame. The sin. The soul is sinning. The suffering, eternal suffering that will come upon them if they keep on sinning. So they talk about Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the atonement of Christ. The blood of Christ, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Show them the way of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Don't allow Satan to deceive them. Don't allow Satan to lead them away from the Lord. Grab them, pull them. Pull them, draw them, bring them to the Lord. What are you doing? Are you just a hearer of the word only, not a doer of the word? 
You heal yourself away from sinners. You don't even talk to them. In your neighborhood. They can't hear the word of God from you. You sneak in and sneak out of the house. And the people don't know. They have not heard the gospel from you. Tell them of Jesus who died for them. Don't let the sinner perish. They can be saved. And demonstrate the change of life. Demonstrate the salvation. The transformation of life. Let them see it in your life. That you'll see the miracle working power of God in your life. The transforming power of Christ in your life. And you'll be asking my friend, what can I do to be saved? When you are saved, you will not have to tell them. Just tell them the evidence of that salvation, faith in the Redeemer. And they will know whether they have faith in that Redeemer or not. Forgiveness and reconciliation. They know whether the enmity in their heart has been taken away or not. Whether they reconcile with God or not, they will know. Freedom from retribution. The load of condemnation will leave them. The load of guilt will leave them. And they will know that they are not going to be judged again because they are passed from judgment onto justification. Fellowship and new relationship. Fellowship and new relationship. They will build new relationship with the people of God when they are truly saved. They will be the fruit of repentance. And the first fruit of righteousness. That will be the foundation to their full redemption. Promise the Lord, you will do it. Promise the Lord, you will do it. Don't let, don't let your study come into the Bible study be vain. Let there be new life, new attitude, new response, new yieldedness, new commitment to this ministry of evangelism and soul winning. 